We're live. There is a oh, some problem anyhow. Okay. And we have some connections problem, but it's fine. Hi, hi to all. Uh, this is the first episode of uh, Live with Panis uh, podcast. It will be a day. It will be a daily podcast um, uh, from Monday to Friday uh, at seven Central Eastern Europe time in Europe, uh, eight o'clock Cyprus. Uh, you know, it's ten o'clock in San Francisco and, and anywhere in the world. Uh, we were going to, we invited, uh, every time we'll have a tech entrepreneur with us to discuss his journey, his struggles, uh, what he's doing with his startup and the, and the, and the tech company that he runs. Uh, for the first uh, episode, um, we will keep it pretty simple, basically. So if you want to, wherever you are broadcasting now, and you can see us, or uh, you can write your comment uh, or question, we'll get all the questions of the audience at the end. But our first guest is Kostas Halkias, the co-founder of uh, Mister Labs. Uh, welcome, Kostas. Good to see you again, Pani. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, many years. Uh, with Costas, we met actually in a big data hackathon in, in Athens. And then we connected, I invited him. He came to Cyprus for the people that they don't know I'm based in Cyprus. Costas is a Greek entrepreneur now. He's based in Palo Alto. He will tell us more about that. And... And I brought you, we did an event in the University of Nicosia about blockchain. Actually, it was most probably was one of the first events about blockchain six, seven years ago, maybe even more. In Cyprus, uh, Osas explained some of their, the product they had, etc. Uh, but Kostas, let's go to, let's go, I mean, let's start from the beginning. I mean, the early days, you are a student, why uh, tell us your story from a student and why did you decide it? Also what inspired you to pursue a career in tech? And, and eventually right now you are running with other founders, your own company. Thanks for the intro, Pani. Um, so very quickly, by the way, one of these uh, guys who studied in Greece, um, I got my bachelor's, my master's, and eventually the PhD in, uh, in Greek universities. Uh, the PhD was also like collaboration between University of Macedonia, like northern part of Greece, and uh, Aristotle University. But also I had to do with um, uh, Philips and Sagem in Paris and in, uh, uh, in France. But generally I was in Europe, right? Now I'm in the U.S., completely different mentality. I will explain what are the, like some uh, major differences uh, between how I used to think as a student, as an early entrepreneur in Europe and now in the US. Um, the, the most interesting part, because I'm a cryptographer, if, if you don't know what cryptography means, imagine I'm, uh, I used to be a white hacker uh, trying to crack systems or trying to find algorithms to protect uh, uh, like data or even digital signatures, privacy in general. Um, but I wasn't always like this. As a student, my first uh, projects were related to, to betting and artificial intelligence. So imagine uh, even, at, even before I joined university, uh, this was even before 2000, 1998, I, I used to know how to code. Like uh, my parents were, I was lucky that my parents bro bought me back then an uh, Amstrad CPU uh, that I could do, uh, what was the, what the language, basic 1.1. So I learned how to code Wonder Boy, Bubble Bubble, I mean, very basic games, arcade games back then. And then at the age of like 15, 16, I was almost ready to do like better stuff, even web pages and so. Um, 
So I did artificial intelligence. I was never uh, uh, like uh, super good at cryptography or security, but I was really good at uh, trading. And in general, the, the project back then was called Pet Manager. And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is it was a university project where we tried to predict soccer outcomes. Uh, it was very easy back then. You can even, like, you have, like, a Cypriot uh, soccer team playing against, like, Barcelona. And by the data that we could accumulate from uh, from the web, we could actually identify a few patterns, if a game is fixed, if the game is actually having some awkward, uh, like, money transfers and all of this stuff. And we're, we were trying to use this data to, to make some predictions. We did really well. Uh, in practice, I think... For a while, we might be one of the platforms that had the best uh, success rate on the prediction. However, I got hacked in 2003. And uh, because imagine a lot of people were based on, on the system to get uh, to get tips and uh, like predictions, uh, I was like vastly affected. And then I decided, OK, uh, what's happening here? Someone uh, brought down all of my websites around uh, like uh, this, uh, this initiative. And then I said, I should learn cryptography. And this is where it all started, uh, why, why I was a victim of such an attack. And I very quickly came into the world of like uh, advanced mathematics. And this is where I started to do authentication systems at the very beginning, and then gradually going into very, very deep uh, cryptography lessons. And uh, this was probably like the first years of my bachelor and master's. And on PhD, I worked on a, uh, on a topic which was called time release encryption. How can we encrypt messages to the future? And some of these technologies have been used in uh, like the original uh, Bitcoin protocols. And now even with zero knowledge proofs, like full privacy and all of this stuff, um, I was lucky to be one of the first dealing with the primitives, cryptographic primitives uh, that had to do with uh, all of these topics, which inspired me to be in the sector of security and cryptography. I mean, one and forever, right? Um, and uh, it was amazing. I mean, even if you if you start from Greece, the, the I mean, some people don't know it, but the blockchain revolution didn't necessarily start in the US. I mean, especially, you know, that the first, university that had to do with blockchain courses was in Cyprus, right? It was a uh, 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 University of Nicosia and from Polemitis that they had a master's degree on, on the blockchain, which means that I was in a place after the recession and during the recession actually of the Greek economy that everyone was actually trying to find solutions. How can we escape from this thing? And this explains why not only me, but many Greeks and Cypriots are actually flourishing in the blockchain space. And one of the best examples, Pani, is the fact that uh, in one of the most recent um, cryptography conferences, the financial crypto one, 20% of the reviewers are Greeks and Cypriots. Imagine in a full world, right? Like these two small countries actually had um, a representation uh, which was really high compared to the population that we have. Uh, so I think for, for us, it was in one way. If you do informatics, you learn a few math and some economy. Um, eventually, blockchain is one of the things that uh, you, you end up. And this is what I do for my studies. Um, I don't want uh, to, uh, to go into the very specific details. But then someone grabbed me while I was um, in my PhD. And uh, we tried to create one of the first applications uh, this was in 2009, one of the first applications to do uh, secure uh, exams, like imagine uh, all of the um, national exams that we have to enter university, how can this be secure? Uh, I had some experience by myself when I was giving uh, like my exams, national exams in 2000. I remember there were students actually leaving the classroom while in other places, the students didn't even enter the classroom, so they could even leak the topics. And uh, in practice, uh, this actually led us to create uh, one of the most successful back then applications. It was called uh, uh, Quizidia and Fluxi. It was just before Quizdom. Maybe a few people that are in Greece know Quizdom as the most successful application back then, that it had like trivial pursuit kind of games online. 
Uh, we did really well, but at the same time, it, this was my first entrepreneurship attempt. It didn't work out. So a hint for everyone, don't feel like even on your first attempt that uh, you have to quit, right? Because for me, it was a good lesson. Um, we had a very, very good team, but at the same time, we were really bad probably at doing uh, marketing. And all of us were from informatics. That's another lesson. Ideally, you don't necessarily need everyone to be for, from the same background. And yeah, um, we had some back and forth. We were we had some investments. Uh, back then, we were probably one of the like uh, good funded startups in uh, in Europe in general. And our application managed to be in the top uh like three on both canada and south africa if i remember correctly we're doing uh, really well but we couldn't make money and eventually one of the things that you have to improve is how you can even bring money into the uh like uh, into the company so you can hire better uh like talents across the world and also be able to to do some strategic investments uh even outside greece and we had our headquarters in the us so although my startup was in greece Eventually, it was my first exposure to San Francisco. Um, this helped me a lot, even if it wasn't like a funny story at the very end. And I joined the world of blockchain uh, at the very early days. I, I even worked with the, the first developer of Satoshi, one of the first developers, Mike Harn in London. And then from there, I think this is where it started. Um, I, I was in a consortium of banks, around 100 banks in the world, that they tried to, de to defend against the, the blockchain Bitcoin revolution. Uh, the company is still active. It's called R3, and the blockchain is called Corda. But then after this, I was super lucky, and luck also plays a role in our uh, career. In one conference that I presented something about a new algorithm, Someone from the new uh, team at Facebook that was doing the Libra project, Facebook invested on, on blockchain technology, if you don't know it, um, happened to be in the same room with me while I was presenting my idea. And then they referred me to Facebook. And then this is when I jumped from Europe to from London now to the US, San Francisco. I worked for Facebook for three years. I was leading the cryptography of Facebook. Uh, many Greeks as well at Facebook and, and Cypriots, right? You don't, you shouldn't think that it's very difficult to go there. It's easy. You have to, you have to have some uh, like preparation and actually be able to to solve a few of the standard problems. But other than this, I I, I believe that one mistake I did, I was late. Like it, this happened at my 33, 34, to join the Silicon Valley dream. Uh, I thought I would never be able to actually go through the interview process and many people would be smarter than me and so on. But eventually it's not, it's not so different. It's pretty much the same. You need some discipline. And I think with just a few couple of months of training, you, you, you will make it. I can even help people right now, even if you're hearing, if you're in this uh, uh, like stream right now. I know a few tricks now how to slightly improve your chances to go there. Either this is Alphabet, Google, Apple. Microsoft, Meta, uh, Netflix, and so on. And the Libra project didn't work. Um, we had many issues with regulation. I think, Bunny, you can ask me many questions around this. Um, but Yeah, uh, we can take questions after about this. Yeah. Uh, but then eventually, uh, a team of some of the leaders at Facebook, like the people who got promoted in the recent... Uh, uh, quarters and like some of the best minds at Facebook's Libra team, we joined our forces and we created Mister Labs. And this is how my story went from a student to machine learning to being hacked. After being hacked, I, I got uh, very uh, obsessed about uh, security. And this helped me actually. I was lucky as well that the Bitcoin started at the time that I was finishing my PhD. And this is how I ended up on being uh, like a cryptographer and the blockchain expert. So yeah, that's my story. Cool, <laughs> An interesting, very interesting story. Uh, but Pani, I will let you know that I made more money from betting than still from Bitcoin and <laughs> blockchains. Back then, the market was so 
immature that everyone with a very simple machine learning algorithm could be super rich. Um, yeah, now I don't know if these things work anymore because stock market companies entered the betting market and now you're competing against other big machines, right? It's the same thing as trading. Uh, so, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, but uh, what inspired you actually to, to go into tech? And it was the situation with your father and basically that, that was the... Yeah. Was it, as you, as you grow, grow and, you know. It played a role, right? There is there is a benefit, I don't think, because I now have two sons, by the way. One is four-year-old and the other is two-year-old. Um, uh, imagine, I mean, when you say inspiration, I will give you a hint that my name of my older son is Kryptos. We literally call, call him Kryptos Halkias, right? It's, <laughs> it's not any random name that you can imagine, which seems that I'm also excited about what I'm doing, right? But why? Why? The fact that I had a computer um, in uh, at my house, even uh, when I was like five or six years old, before the internet era, and when you couldn't actually get lost into watching YouTube and actually doing other stuff, the only things that I could do is playing games. And I had this ba uh, this book. This is this, this is actually the thing that uh, drove me into into tech, uh, Pani. It was the fact that I had the book. It was only uh, it was my first English book. Imagine in Greece, we're not like Cyprus, where English is generally like your first language or your second language at the very early ages. You're starting learning English after 10, 12 uh, years old. So I had the book, which was in English. And the things I could see there was if, else, for, while, uh, and this kind of stuff. And then I got so surprised that you can, even with five or six uh, lines of code, you can you can build something that is smart or it prints something that you told it to do it, to do so. And I got this uh, like contagion uh, since then. And I continued using my computer even for my studies. Imagine I was one of the first students who wrote the, the essays in uh, uh, like typewriting, right? In a computer, I, I, didn't, I didn't use handwriting. This helped me a lot, why? I didn't make a lot of uh, like typos. Every single time my, my essay was clean, there was no like a scratching of, of letters and using the uh, I don't know, ink on top of ink and, and blah, blah, blah. And this actually felt like, oh, you can have an advantage here. You know, now we have this chat GPT and AI. I'm using <laughs> it, by the way. I'm using it yeah. personally. If someone learns from a very early age to get advantage of a new technology at the time it comes, this continues actually being an advantage even in the rest of like 20 years later and, and so on. So for me, I, I went to 15 years old that I could code. I know how to run very basic stuff. And then you see, oh, there is a spreadsheet. There is an Excel in Microsoft. Oh, if you go to macros, if you go to macros, this is also coding. And then you say, oh, uh, it's the same thing that I, I've learned to do for, for games. And then I can use it again and again for, for different things in life. And obviously, when the time came, I applied for computer science, right? I didn't go to be a, a lawyer or something else. Just because I felt I had a small advantage, plus I liked what I did. So if you're asking by, I mean, for my inspiration, uh, I was not born by a rich family, right? My family was always uh, low middle class. But the fact that they bought me a computer, they didn't allow me to go into, actually, there wasn't internet back then. Um, I just had the basics to actually inspire me to start coding without being distracted. And this made a, uh, like a small tick in the back of my mind to say, okay, that's what I will do. Yeah, and you said that you started from young age. Uh, do you think and education coding needs to start from young age? Um, or oh. any age or... I am biased. I, I am biased on this. I will give you some examples. And let's see, right? I, I, I'm happy to, to debate here. So, you know, even on chess, there is no grand master, if I remember correctly, that they, are, they learned chess after the year, after the six year, yeah, after six year old. All of the grand master actually started 
learning chess earlier. There is a reason for this. Obviously, you are making some synapses and um, you're getting advantages at a very early age. And this actually drives you to always feel, oh, I can be better and I can be better. And I'm already in the top uh, like 100, 200. And this gives you a net compared to anything else. Obviously, you can change directions because uh, computer science is very broad these days. But in general, I think it helps if, if the family can actually um, uh, avoid any distraction. The, 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 the major thing that I'm afraid today is you might give access to the child from a very early age to, to the internet and they might get lost. With some like proper preparation and actually education, both parents, I mean, when they are available, they can, they can help. I think it's helpful up to a point. However, I've seen one of the best iOS developers that I've seen in my life started coding on 35. So I have two examples that are completely in a different uh, direction. Um, I feel that you can get an advantage if you start earlier. But at the same time, it's so broad that people can find gaps. Um, there is new technology every few years. For example, blockchain was not a thing. And as a cryptographer, what would I do, Pani? I would be an academic. There was nothing else I could do, right? So if you find, in my opinion, something that makes a difference, if you ask me, is when you combine two industries. If you are good to computer science and you learn, I don't know, education, or you learn economics, or you learn mathematics, or you learn physics, or you learn medicine, I don't know, something else, usually there is a gap there where both of the technologies can create products or actually have a new sector being formed. This is, I believe, if, if you ask me what I see in Silicon Valley, you can see always generalists, but the people who somehow combine two technologies, they usually have less opportunities for job, especially for this topic, but when they find, they don't have competitors. So that's, I mean, if you ask me, that's my personal, uh, my personal view and proposal. There is no age where you can be like super strong in, uh, in computer science. While you're getting older, however, you have to have the expert eye to look for gaps. And there you don't have competition. So you're like uh, being six years old in a new field and you're 35, you know better where to focus on. Sure. Great. And uh, before we continue with the questions, because we have some nice comments, I'm going to bring them in the screen. Uh, George Kratobulos. Uh, it's uh, saying. Um, My regards to George, by the way. I know George personally. Now yeah, what well, I? Yeah. Uh, okay. It's, He's also, a... he's also going to be a talent, by the way. He's very young yet. Uh, but yeah, he's going to be a talent. I know. But to join and care from a long distance, yeah, technology, uh, of course, that is in California, I'm in Cyprus, and we're doing a podcast. Uh, this is technology. And uh, Vaso Miku, congratulations. Always successes for you. Uh, Yannis Hajiani, uh, people, people like Costas are a great inspiration. I love watching people starting pretty much uh, early and, uh, and end up where he dreams to be one day. Um, in this podcast, we are going to bring people like Costas or also bring young entrepreneurs also. Uh, as we said, uh, this podcast would be about... Uh, all ages, tech entrepreneurs of all ages, because in the last 10 years I'm doing just startup journalism. I, I met also young people in hackathons that they did great stuff. Uh, but um, let's go a bit about uh, to your co-founders. Uh, how did you meet the uh, Costas, your co-founders? Okay, you said you met in Facebook, uh, but in general, how, how, you, how do you select the co-founder? And then and, and, uh, just to finish the question, uh, do you believe that right now you have the right team to build your vision? Uh, how do you plan to do it with Mr. Lab? Um, I'll give you some uh, very interesting story around this and I will explain why I ended up in Mr. Labs. 
By the way, uh, all of us came from Facebook, right? The, we were leaders in different teams across Facebook, but also that's very important. And I wouldn't do the same mistake again, or at least I, I would like to try something else. We're not the same profile. So I was a cryptographer. We had someone who was an expert on distributed systems. This is George Danesis. It's also Greek. We have Sam, Sam Plax here, who is a CTO, and Sam was um, one of the youngest people, if not the youngest one, who got promoted at Facebook at that level. And he actually wrote a new language, the move language that we're using, which is like the, uh, as we say, a better version of Solidity that is used in Ethereum. Imagine a guy who was not even 30, 30 created this language, right? It's insane. And, and then we had Adenigi, uh, and Adenigi has like a very uh, broad background coming even from London. And you remember, I used to live in London. So uh, like uh, even culturally, I was very close to Adenigi and he was more of a product oriented person with great ideas. And I loved him even uh, from the very first day that he joined uh, Libra back then. And then we had Evan and Evan used to be my manager at Facebook. Uh, so Evan used to be one of the best uh, like people to create teams. He did it on Apple. If you are running LLVM, or if you are having an iPhone, you're running code from Evan. If you are running code from WhatsApp, you're running code from myself. If you are running uh, some uh, um, like product decisions around how mining used to work on Bitcoin, probably you ran some ideas of Adenigi. And if you Sam was also at Facebook, probably you're running, you have Facebook, you're running code from Sam. And then Evan, uh, as I said before, has created some of the best teams in the world and you are running his code as well. So all of this, we're leaders in the computer science field. However, we took completely different directions and our profiles do not match necessarily, which was a good thing. We're also five people, right? We're not two or three, that we can actually split our resources to do all of the meetings required with the investors. And then if you want to go technical in the programming language, hey, we have some, our CTO does this. When they ask questions about cryptography, you can jump in. When they ask questions about how to build a new blockchain, then George is coming. And then when you build about new ideas, new products, like a better wallet, then Adenigi is coming. In my opinion, this is a dream team. Uh, we happen to be five. I love basketball. And then I said, it's uh, it's insane, right? How, how often do you find these people to work together? Um, I will say, however... That even in my previous places where the people were not so strong or their profile was uh, literally uh, mainly on the European uh, mentality, you still have the options to do stuff. You start probably from a lower uh, uh, like uh, position. However, the upside is also high because, I mean, imagine the lifestyle and, and the cost of living here in the U.S. is by far higher. And obviously, you are shooting for, for something better and you have better options for unicorns. But there are many ideas that can actually win against local markets where, for example, uh, uh, companies, other companies might not focus on. And then you don't need to have necessarily people who already build a team of 100 uh, persons or they were at Apple or Netflix. So both of these things work, but at, the, at this time, if you ask me compared to what I know and from people that I hear now and there, um, especially in Silicon Valley, I feel blessed. We have a great, a great team and I can see that if we were two, we wouldn't have time. Do you know what is to be a unicorn? You have uh, so many uh, like discussions with investors and you have to actually have a community. You know, we have a Discord community. Our Discord community last, uh, actually two days ago, surpassed the 500,000 members. It's not easy, right? You cannot be everywhere. And now being five people, all of them experts in their field, actually helps a lot to split and distribute our resources. Plus, we have a particular skill set per person. Someone is good at something else and someone is good at something uh, different. For and me, um, this, this was a relief. This was a relief, uh, right? Yeah, I want to say a big thank you and a honor to that. A unicorn actually is taking the time, a founder of a unicorn is taking the time to come to my podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, there is a reason why I, I'm here, right? And I will yeah. mention it because your, your audience should know. 
Well, the nice thing with Panis is at the very, very beginning of even my personal steps and other people's steps, he was one of the guys who actually used to drive innovation, especially across Greece and Cyprus. And he even had the guts to, org- to organize events and other things against all of the odds, right? Uh, and I loved it. And in some sense, uh, I'm not saying I owe it to you because obviously we're all busy and we're all doing stuff. But it helped me. I cannot hide this. It helped me that you invited me back then in Cyprus. I met uh, 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 Polemitis. And then uh, I even created uh, like a very interesting paper with one of the professors there in Cyprus. Uh, and then you were also very active even in Greece because we met in Greece. We didn't meet in Cyprus, right? And even in Europe, in other conferences, uh, for me, I mean, if you don't give incentives to these people who are doing this, at the very beginning of their life, even without financial incentives, just because they like it, I don't think I would ever be in this place. And many other yeah, people... Yeah, but then I was monitoring the Greek ecosystem. It was in Hakkara crowd policy we met. Yeah. We actually, we were going... It was a bit of um, a coincidence, a mistake we found the hackathon. We, we were the Technopolis. We saw... We saw some people there doing stuff, and then we heard it was a hackathon, and then I went in, I spoke with the guys, and I spoke with the teams, and this is how I found you there with the team built in coding. And yeah, um, let's say we have some questions. All the questions will answer a bit at the end. Um, Tony is saying, thank you for the opportunity to learn about this. Thank you, Tony, for watching and all the people we're watching. If you have any comments, drop them. We have people watching from LinkedIn. We're actually live stream right now, Facebook, in, in Twitter, in LinkedIn, uh, in YouTube and other places. Um, but uh, let's let's go about the Mister Labs. Tell us a bit more, more about what you are doing uh, yeah. with the C Foundation. And yeah. So Mr. Labs is a company uh, that was formed, as I said before, from five leaders at Facebook and we're building infrastructure for blockchain. Imagine uh, we're advertising it as a better Ethereum. Uh, we have uh, one of the fastest consensus schemes. When, when people say, hey, I'm building a new blockchain, it's, I mean, there are good blockchains and blockchains that are copy paste of different things, right? For us, we have uh, like many innovations in place. One is that we... Uh, we build a system where you can even uh, have like sub-second transactions, uh, finalization, something that is very, very difficult to do, even because uh, sometimes you are limited by the speed of light. Uh, and the schemes to actually agree which transaction goes on chain is expensive, right? The blockchain, imagine it has a distributed database and many entities are voting or are doing mining in other blockchains in order to agree what goes in and what stays out. This agreement, especially if you're in a distributed uh, environment, it's expensive, right? It takes some time. We managed to actually create some um, speed records there. And then we say, okay, we have all of the foundation required to actually have a faster blockchain that can even go and uh, see in the eyes even traditional databases. And then there was a second um, uh, like uh, advantage that we had. We created a new language for blockchain. And, you know, creating a new language for a new system that is not controlled by one entity, it's not easy. We did this stuff starting from Facebook. We extended it as Mr. Labs. And then it was in one way, right? Let's do it. I also added all of the uh, pieces for cryptography. And then we, uh, we added some financial incentives and how people can participate on this. Because what is a blockchain? Again, it's a distributed database. What it replaces? It replaces notaries. Like we know notaries and lawyers in our real world and they put their signature on contracts. Every transaction that we make in the real world is in practice and contract. Even if you go and buy from Starbucks something, you have a contract with Starbucks. I pay you and you're going to give me coffee. So in this, in, uh, in this model of, of blockchains, we digitized uh, the notary system in a decentralized way, plus offering uh, speed records and all of this stuff. So we got the blessing very, very quickly from some of the best VCs in the world. 
address in Horovitz, Redpoint, even Binance is with us, Circle, Samsung Next. Um, there are so many. I think it's like more than 100 investors eventually. Some of them are angel investors, even from Cyprus, Greece, Europe in general, of course, many in the US. And uh, it was in one way because we had the, like a very a core of the team that was familiar with all of the uh, different flavors of like blockchain and different processes for which you, you need some expertise to build the blockchain. There is one of the reasons um, uh, that having such a core, you can start with people that are super smart, but you don't necessarily need uh, like the uh, someone who, who's already uh, like uh, in a place where they can build the blockchain by themselves because we could do it. We could drive people very easily. What this means is we attracted talent from Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple. Do you know how many of them are in our company now? More than 40 people. And that's why I'm saying we have a unicorn now. And this unicorn has a base where more than 100 and something, 20. I don't remember uh, every single day we're adding new people on, uh, like uh, in our company. There is a reason for this. And I know there is a question from George, George Michoulis here. And I will re respond to this. Why for us this is beneficial? Um, uh, many people actually got uh, out of job just because Facebook, Apple, and some others, not Apple, but Netflix and, and others are uh, in a layoff situation now. Yeah. But for them, we are a magnet, right? Because we are one of the latest unicorns in the space. We obviously, when you come here, you work, as I said, with some of the best in the, in the field. And then because the, the, the world is a scale-free network, it's more like it's more possible that someone who lives and do they want to go to a startup, they join a team that they can actually communicate and they know that we're serious. And this created a domino effect where we attracted many, many, I mean, more talents than I even expected at the very beginning. Imagine that in the course of one year, we, uh, we are already more than 100. If you see all of the profiles of people, even if you search on LinkedIn, it's like selected one by one, right? Imagine we had thousands of applications. Um, but we're generally, uh, I mean, if we see people who are passionate with, uh, with the blockchain field, we have one of the best um, like training programs. Even if you are not in the field, you cannot expect to find the next Satoshi, but you expect to find someone who is good at security, who is good at databases, good at product design and all of this, and then we can send them to a new, le a new level. And this is what we do. We also, even in this one year course, we already have promotions and, and Mr. Labs is super healthy and obviously well backed, right? We raised more than 336 million and the company is valued at 2 billion plus now. Um, so we're doing blockchain, as I said, a new blockchain with better properties. And in the next few months, we're also going to launch the product, which is called Sui, um, like sweet, the dessert without the tea at the end. We call it Sui. Uh, and and we, we were expecting to be one of the most uh, like successful blockchains, especially in cases where you need high traffic. Imagine games. Games are joining the blockchain space for many reasons. You can buy a weapon on one game, and then you can sell this in a different game, and then the other game can even use this weapon to play. And now they found a place where you can do auctions, you can do voting, you can do transfer of assets like NFTs, and you can do DeFi, you can even trade, um, you can even do loans, you can do real estate. You can even build a Twitter on the blockchain, right? And our model actually is super helpful. And I know there are companies that are already doing it because we're super fast and we have a model. What, what is each tweet? Each tweet is an NFT. When you're tweeting something or this post that you made for this podcast, in practice, it's an NFT. You own it. You published it. It's public. Everyone can see it. And then someone can reference it. And then this is how I respond to your NFT. I respond to your NFT with an NFT. And this is creating like a new paradigm in, in the space. And this is why we believe Mist and Labs will, will be successful. When we launch our NFT, my NFT actually, of the podcast, definitely we'll use Sui to do it. <laughs> and Yeah, uh, it will also be super cheap, which is another yeah. thing, right? Also in Cyprus in September, Sigma War is coming. One of the biggest events on 
gaming, eye gaming, it, happen, it happens also. So maybe it's good to bring you down on September, maybe. I wish I can do it, but even if I cannot, you know that we already have a solution engineering team in Greece and even Cypriots are actually working there. Uh, you know my story anyway that, uh, as you said, I'm an ambassador of the Greek and Cypriot community because all of like my early friends were Cypriots and Greek. Um, imagine that even the betting program that I explained at the very beginning of this uh, like podcast, three of my co-founders were Cypriots. I was the only Greek. Um, and, and yeah, I, I love it. If I can help, I, it's my pleasure to, to do here. Okay, because you, you, you talk about the Greek diaspora right now, that you are ambassador. Um, do you think this uh, upbringing influence anyhow the road to success? I'm not In, sure, right? Because it's, it's still... Being, too, being Greek? <laughs> it's still too early. Well... Sometimes you have, uh, he here's the thing. I have a feeling that our culture and the fact that we both like both countries face some recession or um, like different things that our money were actually locked in a bank account and we couldn't even uh, use the, uh, the deposits that we used to have. They created a completely different mindset. And I think at least in the blockchain space, but I will say in all of the research uh, uh, space, we're well-educated, right? I mean, many people do have yeah. a bachelor degree. They go to master's. I mean, our mentality is education because of our history. And in my opinion, this helps more than uh, myself actually expressing uh, gratitude for Greece and Cyprus. Yes, there is a reason, however, why I do it, because I feel confident, right? This is this is the main reason eventually. So it's, it's like a chicken and the neck thing. Who is helping who? I don't know. Probably Cyprus and Greece help me more then I help Greece and Cyprus by myself. Yeah. And, okay, some important milestones. You said, okay, you raised 300, uh, 330 million for the Misten Labs. What do you think is the most, uh, was the most important milestones for Misten Labs? First, the decision to leave Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> because it wasn't easy, right? Imagine for yeah. myself as an immigrant in many different places, the fact that we all managed to come together at a very specific moment where we knew that uh, Libra is not going to fly, it was very important. Because as I told you, I had many opportunities at the time I decided to leave Facebook to go to different startups and even going to another fund, right? I could go to... Like, I'm, uh, I'm trying to obfuscate here. I could go to Google. I could go to Apple. But Microsoft, I had options. Um, the most important milestone is we managed to create the team of these five founders. And it was very tricky because it had to be done in a very short amount of time. Otherwise, all of us would go to different places. Yeah. Right? You, you understand how it works in this case, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You are in a state where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find my next endeavor. And then somehow, just because we, we were all uh, ready to start something new, uh, we were lucky that we joined our forces out of accident. This happened, right? I mean, nobody collaborated with anyone. It's just we had a very friendly uh, chat. And then we decided, oh, I wanted to do this as well. You wanted to do this as well. Let's join our forces. So that's the major milestone because we went to meetings to VCs with only our expertise and some decks, and we managed to raise our first 36 million, right? Because people, these VCs, believed in the team. We didn't have a product back then. Yeah, yeah. So in my opinion, this plays a huge role. There is a difference between Europe and like Silicon Valley. It's not easy to do this in Europe. But at the same time, even in Silicon Valley, without like great profiles, it's not easy to do it as well here, right? It's It's... This, this is definitely the most important milestone, if you ask me. The next thing, like the extra 300 million, came because of, uh, uh, like, uh, naturally, because the team grew really fast, we managed to meet expectations regarding delivering stuff of high-quality high stuff. And then it was impossible in this market of blockchains where every, even uh, like blockchains that are not great, they, they have a particular market cap. We couldn't be outside the situation, right? I mean, our team was so strong 
that we had to raise more to actually build something uh, that is equivalent to what we expected to offer to the to the world, to the community. So for me, the second iteration, although more important because you raised more money, it's of less importance than the first one, right? That you go there and for the first time you raise your first money. I don't think there is anything equivalent to this. Uh, the second thing is we launched our testnet. And believe me, I've seen many projects building something in half a year. And now we're literally one year after the um, uh, Mistens, uh, like uh, creation. It's, it's rare. Almost impossible, right? Without a good team, you cannot do it. So for me, the fact that we delivered SWE and we are ready for mainnet in uh, the next few months is also a great milestone. And if you ask for my career, like the fact that I'm also, like I started as a CTO in a company, then I, get, I went back to Facebook as a regular employee. And then I go back to uh, like the chief of cryptography in a big organization, one of the most promising ones right at, at the moment. For me, it was also a great milestone, right? I mean, if you see the innovation we do there, it's it, it can be like equivalent to two or three funks. All of them together are exploring at, at this stage because there are at least top, we have at least 10 people who are top researchers in their field, in the world. And the company is 120 people, right? Like It's like 10% of the company is in the top brains in the world. And for me, this is also a huge milestone, the fact that we managed to bring into our, under our umbrella, all of these uh, huge brains. Yeah, that's, that's very difficult to happen. And as you said, uh, uh, it's split moments that you, you do that, and then you move on. Um, at the moment, okay, um, what's the most exciting thing about the, the traction of Mister? Uh, so everyone is waiting for our mainnet. Uh, so they want to, to trade SUI, they want to use SUI, they want to create new applications for SUI. Um, we had a great milestone, by the way, as I told you just uh, a few days ago, we had um, a testnet that was successful. And then, as I told you, in, in a few months, our Discord actually surpassed any expectation. We're going closer to a million gradually, right? And the company doesn't even have a public product. We're now launching the public product. People are just testing our product now uh, without this being like tradable yet. Um, and what is exciting is when you see, like when you press this button and you see like other people using your wallet or other people using your algorithms, it makes me excited. I mean, for me, working at Misten, this was always my, uh, my personal mentality on this one. I see my work as a hobby. I'm not kidding, right? I can work as uh, many hours as you can see. You can, I mean, we are friends as well. You can see me in very awkward time zones and hours always being uh, awake because I love what I'm doing. And by the time we deliver something, it's the most exciting moment. We also have algorithms that we're delivering, but we also have products. Well, SWE itself, the fact that we published Testnet and we're going through mainnet in uh, mainnet for those who don't know it's the public like as you trade ethereum and, and bitcoin you can you can use uh, sui for, for this it's it's going to be the most uh, exciting moment for me it's just a few months away cool okay uh, uh, you know i mean nowadays uh, a lot of people they are discussing about sustainability and etc. I mean, do you have something like this uh, in you in the company? Okay, a lot of people they say that crypto is not sustainable. What are your thoughts? And comments okay, on well, this? in my opinion, blockchain technology in general will uh, will survive any any turbulences here. There, there is a reason for this, right? It solves some of the problem, especially transparency, eventually privacy. Um, also, regulation is coming. For me, that's a good thing. Uh, you know that all of my previous work was to improve against the processes that are like in the gray zone. Imagine I was the first one that I reported some issues with the algorithms used for proofs of solvency on Binance. 
And I mean, you can find my report there. Even if they're an investor, I'm trying to provide transparency to the system. So I think with all of these um, uh, like initiatives, the blockchain will become eventually, and even after regulation, uh, a very stable, uh, uh, like uh, more stable environment. Obviously, there was volatility in the past, but at the same time, it's not only this, right? We had many projects that didn't offer anything, but they offered the hype. This hype also helps because it's also a game, right? You start, you start uh, 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 like playing with with a new industry, and maybe some people see other opportunities here. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the core of the system is, as I said before, you have a distributed notary system. This will survive, right? Because, I mean, imagine even if a government now uh, dissolves, you might not have even access to the documents. You don't even know if, if you had ownership of some assets or real estate. If these were in a place where they cannot be deleted or there is privacy, you can even add the auditors and the regulators in, uh, in the uh, equation where... They can see a few things just to avoid like uh, any terrorism or sanctions or other stuff. But at the same time, it's it's like high, highly possible that this data will survive any, uh, any particular event in, uh, in humanity. While in some particular cases, putting everything in under one country or one company, even if this is Amazon and AWS, you never know what will happen. Right? You see how Facebook almost... Uh, it didn't collapse, but the, the price of the stock actually went really down three, four times from, from its high, right? You never know if a big company will survive. So in my opinion, there will be uh, like a place in uh, next couple of years. You never know what this, uh, this date is, because if I knew, I would know how to trade and how to make money out of this. But I don't believe there is anything else at the moment that uh, will stop um, many of the services that we use in today's world to go to the blockchain state. If you ask me about cryptocurrencies in general, that some of them are speculative or they have high volatility, eventually this will smooth out. There will be still opportunities because even in the stock market, there is volatility in some particular stocks, right? Because they create a new product and one day it was Moderna, for example, that they found a new drug for, uh, for COVID. It eventually it went up. There might be a new algorithm that will make the notary system by far better. It will go up, of course. There will be another system that storage is super cheap. It will go up, of course. So um, what I'm doing is I'm looking only at um, particular quality factors that I can judge when I either invest on a blockchain or I trying to think about the future of the blockchain industry in general. There are a few qualities that I cannot find in other systems at the moment. Obviously, there is a hype on AI. I think there was a question here. Yes, of course, there is a hype on AI. I cannot even see how this AI will not be connected to blockchains. Someone, and I know a few startups are doing it, they're trying to use this AI as a new service in the blockchain space. This might be better sharding, better scalability, just because I have data now and I know how to put our servers in different places so they can accommodate more users. Uh, it can be better financials. It can be uh, opportunities for trading. This will happen. I don't see how the, how we'll avoid this. So blockchain and AI will be married eventually. Yeah, true. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, Kostas, what is your daily motivation? To... Oh, uh, that, that's interesting. Okay. By the way, since my since I have a family now, the yeah. fact that I am teaching my my older one Python, <laughs> it's my daily motivation. He's four years old, but he learned how to do EFLs now. Uh, that's a motivation, of course. But at the same time, if you ask me about Mistan Labs, um, well, my passion is to create new algorithms, right? When I go there and I see that we have a problem and I have a solution for this or I can be in a brainstorming uh, like mode of trying to fix it, this excites me. I cannot explain it. It's like playing uh, League of Legends or what is what is now the, the most uh, like popular game. I love it. I love solving algorithms. And this actually inspires me to, to deal with this uh, again in the game. Cool. 
Our coming from Kevin Matt, great lessons, necessities, the matter of inventions, fast decision making, collaboration with others, uh, love what you do. And <coughs> love what, what do you think about failure? You know, it's a question that in our industry, you know, in Europe, I think US is different. The mentality in Europe is different. How, how do you see it? Here is the thing, right? I've seen I've seen failures in my life. As I told you, I had a startup. It didn't manage to 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 go further, even if we raised one two millions back then. Back then, it was important, right? It's not as easy. It wasn't as easy as it is today. Um, well, failure is obviously for the team to dissolve, and we don't do anything, and we don't even use the IPs of the company to build something different. That's that's my personal. Uh, like uh, terminology of failure, at least for this company. Uh, but you are learning so many things. And obviously, if you are in, a, uh, in an entrepreneurship mindset, you will find a few lessons that will help you on your next, uh, on your next thing. Failure is always accompanied by great uh, lessons and ideas. And probably you can even build a network out of this failure that you didn't expect. The thing that I realized here in the US compared to Europe is for some reason in Europe, I felt that everything is my child and I have to, like I'm spending other people's money and I couldn't afford it very easily in the sense that I had a, co a constant pressure of like achieving. Here it comes more natural. After some experience, Pani, um, I have a feeling that I now know exactly what I'm doing. I have learned from the failures. And now I believe I have more opportunities to actually go to a, uh, like a better success place, not only for me, but also for the investors and the people who, who will play with Sui. There will be small failures, but I mean, as you grow up, you learn how to survive under this, right? I mean, sometimes you have to do pivoting. Um, I mean, the company is so well-funded that I don't see any single failure to actually affect the company by itself. Uh, maybe a sequence of three, four failures might might cause issues. But at this moment, if you ask me, I don't see in the next uh, like year something that will completely dissolve the whole the whole company. Okay, cool. Um, the before we move to, I have also some other questions. But before we move, let's. Okay, you work uh, for Facebook a huge tech company. Now you're building your own huge tech company. Um, how was the time in Facebook? If you can share some stuff also. I love and, it. And, and what is the difference right now? I mean, we, yeah. By, by the way, in all of the places that I've been in the past, I, I know how to adapt uh, to the current mindset and culture of the company. And even at Facebook, I had great time, right? I'm not, I mean, someone, I think, who was it? I think it was Yanis, right? Um, Yanis mentioned, is it, was it Yanis? Yeah. Um, Yanis mentioned here in the chat that um, eventually you, you end up into a dream job. For me back then it was Facebook just because you go to this fund and then you, you don't expect you will ever be there. However, yeah. you quickly realize that it's not different than others. On the other side, you get this badge that I was in a fund one day in my life. Fund is like the top five companies in the world, Facebook, Apple, uh, Alphabet, uh, Netflix, and uh, what was it? Uh, there is another one. Um, so it helped me a lot to actually learn diversity and I got very uh, great lessons. Imagine coming from Europe, you, we also have some like uh, cultural differences between uh, Greece, the rest of Europe, and the US. For me, this multicultural and changing uh, like countries helped me a lot to get into a place where I love and I know how to adapt on any on any new system. Um, at the very beginning of Facebook, we used to work really, really hard because, again, we had to learn stuff. Uh, to tell you the truth, there was a place, a state in my, in my career where when we knew that Libra will not launch, I wasn't happy, right? And I wasn't happy because like Mark Zuckerberg was, uh, was a bad boss and all of this. I mean, if you ask me, I, I was in meetings with them. I was in meetings with leadership. They all wanted the company to survive, right? Maybe there have been some, uh, uh, like, uh, some mistakes down the road, but we didn't control everything. 
unfortunately, a few things were out of our reach, uh, like regulation, um, many, many different things that we couldn't predict. Uh, here, however, I'm, I'm obsessed with what I'm doing again. Like imagine working a lot at Facebook, then for, for two or three years, I didn't even get my paternity leave. I wanted Libra to launch, right? I am probably one of the very, very few people that didn't get uh, free holidays. <laughs> uh, I love working, right? This is, this is something that excites me and I feel energized and all of this stuff. And then I went into, into Misten and on Misten again, I started having a new, a new dream. I think if you have a dream and you do your work as a hobby, you love it, you work hard, really hard. And the most difficult part for me is to do time management between my company and my family. If you ask me what is the thing that I have to improve, is how I can find the balance between these two. It's not easy. It's very difficult, right? This one, I can tell you for sure that if you don't have like uh, someone to, um, to be next to you and support you, it's very, very difficult. My wife does a great job on this one. I should also do um, uh, like a great job to actually fix a few things, like spending a bit more time with them and all of this. That's the only thing that is something that should be fixed. Okay. Um, let's take some questions. And then, okay, pretty much, okay, what do you think about George Mihulis? What do you think about blockchain evolution after the FTX scandal? And then general stuff reduction in the tech companies is the AI the new thing? Okay, you said some stuff about that. I think. Yeah. You, uh, you answer uh, it if you want to add any. I already I already answered about the FTX case, right? Uh, after FTX, we learned a few lessons around centralized exchanges. I'm one of the person that Mister Labs is actually leading this. We are going to help into providing tools to avoid similar situations in the future. Sometimes it's algorithms. For example, it's my algorithm now that you can use it to do proofs of solvency. And uh, in other particular cases, I mean, if you ask me um, how how the, the the blockchain space will evolve, obviously, it's learning from what happened. We will probably see uh, some, uh, not restructuring, but different processes, even regarding auditing, because in most of the cases, it's not the, bl the blockchain platform to, to blame someone who is using the blockchain platform and in this particular case it was a centralized exchange that they missed the target and they missed the the way to run properly and all of this but it wasn't the blockchain uh, uh, a fault from the blockchain platform right it was a thing that a single company that had the product on top of the blockchain affected the reputation of the whole blockchain and i think we're, we're quickly realizing that it shouldn't it shouldn't happen again but I think we're, we're recovering from this. And I can personally, because I'm talking to other blockchains, they are in the mindset now that they have to improve their processes. So for me, this was a, a bad thing for a while, but at the same time, it's good for the evolution and better protection of the future system. Blockchain at the moment, the adoption is very, very small. Like only uh, a very limited uh, set of people is using it for, uh, for applications. But because it's, it's, it's going to be like really big after we solve all of these problems, it takes some time. These things speed up the, uh, the adoption of new technologies for protection. Um, the second one is PhD on blockchain. What do you choose right yeah, now? If you were to choose a PhD on blockchain, what do you choose right now? Do you believe in industrial PhDs? Uh, I believe in any PhD, by the way, right? Um, I'm someone who, if you ask me about education, I think it's one of the best miracles that humanity managed to, to do, right? And the fact that you, we are all, most of the people living here are educated, it's, uh, it's something amazing, right? As a species, as a, like a community, as culture and everything. So anything, I, I would get it. I, I, don't, I don't agree with, um, uh, with comments where the PhD, they say that the PhD is useless sometimes. No, no, no. You're always learning stuff. And sometimes you're carrying a badge and probably the fact that you manage to do research that accompanies you for the rest of your life. It's super important. So what PhD on blockchain? There are generally a few sectors um, that are having different goals, right? If you want to, to learn security, for example, even if blockchain collapses in the next 20 years, it doesn't really matter. Security will stay there. 
right? We, everything is getting automated. Even your doors in the house will be automated. Your cars are automated. We need security. You have dependency on your iPhones now, on your mobile devices. So in my opinion, security, it's something like a bit more general, especially uh, uh, for blockchain, it's obviously it's super important, but you can find like some authentication mechanisms or even ZK snarks that uh, George is also mentioning uh, below. Like for cryptography, if you ask me if I would do a PhD, I would do on zero knowledge proofs. Uh, I personally did on signature schemes back then because zero knowledge proofs didn't even exist, like practical uh, constructions. Uh, but now I would do the number three that George is proposing here. Yes, I, I would do zero knowledge yeah. for, for cryptography. For PhD in general, I would do security and systems uh, because you can you can use it everywhere. I don't think there is any tech company that wouldn't hire someone with a security and uh, or like systems uh, design uh, degree. It's I see. I, I've been in Facebook. I've been. I've worked even with. Uh, like other projects with other other companies, like big companies, this is always something that you you will get a great salary just because you have this PhD. Yeah, Yannis uh, asks also if you have any resources that you suggest for people looking more to oh. develop. Okay. The, 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 there are many things uh, that you can actually have uh, in mind, right? I think it's A16Z. Uh, they have a list of resources. They call it A16Z Canon, if I remember correctly. Um, let me see where it is. I mean, if you search about this, they have the list of huge um, uh, references for what you need to learn about uh, blockchains. Um, go to, A to A16Z like Adrisin Horowitz, and then you will find the list of many resources where you can see how the big VCs are investing and probably what technologies you need to know. This is super, super useful. Yeah, um, this is, they have a whole course in, I think it's in your YouTube or yeah. in their website about how you can build a blockchain company. They have a lot of... Exactly, exactly. I mean, because we, I'm not sure if they are asking about technology or how to build tools for blockchain. The or question how... I think is about resources almost uh, about developing the blockchain. Yeah, developing developing of blockchain um, in usually uh, if you want to be a smart contract developer, in my opinion, because I also took this uh, these courses, um, go and learn Ethereum first, right? You can learn Ethereum. Uh, it's like a course that in Udemy or uh, Udacity, I don't remember the, yeah, it's Udemy if I remember correctly. You can find courses with 10, 20 dollars. And because we did it at Facebook as well, a whole team actually took some Ethereum courses. Everyone was in a completely different level in, uh, uh, in, in one month. So take this and other than this, if you don't implement something by yourself, like in Sui, if you don't go and read the examples, create your first smart contract, you will never realize what the potential is. You have to try it by yourself. Okay, we have another question, but I think we answered it in the beginning about, uh, can you talk about some of the partners you have? Uh, did you sync them out or did they come to you? But I think we answered that question. With the yeah, founder. we, we answered founder. this. We answered this. I will add the one of the most uh, like important partners we have. We have Netmarble and NCSoft, which are like, huge gaming companies if you know games like lineage and some others maybe some people play these games these are the companies behind these games right and they want to go into the blockchain space and they came with us if we find them obviously you have to pitch but usually they know you right so we got some attention after people realized oh the leadership team of, of facebook left and created a new company so it was easier for us to to go to a place and actually listen to us right because sometimes it's very difficult to open the door but after yeah. we open the door we have a very a very good success rate uh, for uh, for for dealings uh, with these companies and orestes uh, has uh, after so many years of blockchain existing are there algorithms and protocols standardized enough to be added to the existing web standards uh, that's that, that's a very interesting question so Orestes, by the way, the blockchain space fixed many of the existing standards. And I can tell you for sure because I personally fixed the EDDSA signature scheme. There were bugs. 
in the standard. And the second thing that we're working at the moment is uh, I know there are a few um, uh, like standards like how do you sign on Web2 and then you can use this signature on a Web3 for authentication. And the other thing that I'm personally leading is the proofs of solvency standard. Um, proof of solvency, how exchanges should do proofs of solvency. And uh, actually, very recently, even the WhatsApp team at Facebook that I used to be like part of this team uh, published a new idea on how to do password authenticated encryption, the PAIC protocols. And I believe that the blockchain is actually improving the security of existing standards by finding bugs or finding inconsistencies. And at the same time, I expect, you're right, I expect them to be like more organized in the next two or three years. The FTX case actually helped on this. The, FKs, the FTX case actually is imposing into like injecting into the system the necessity to have standards from big organizations like uh, uh, W3C and uh, all of them. Okay. Um, Costas, what helped you survive during COVID? <laughs> Family. Yeah. Um, Definitely family, because imagine I'm, I'm an immigrant here. I, I didn't even have time to socialize properly. After one year at Facebook, COVID hit and uh, we were stuck in, in the US. We couldn't even travel to our parents and so on, right? And I think the passion for my, for my job, back then Libra was still a thing. And um, uh, I did everything I could, I could do to actually make it happen. And then imagine even at the time that Mistin was, was created, we were very close at the end of COVID, uh, at least regarding lockdowns and everything. I don't know. Yeah. The, inspiration, the inspiration kept me uh, really energized even during COVID. Um, we didn't have huge lockdowns in the US. I don't know how the situation was in Greece or Cyprus. In my opinion, this also helped here to maintain some sanity, right? Because we could still go out Maybe not in uh, the restaurants every single time, but most of the times they were open under uh, certain protection. So yeah, I know I know from Greek friends that the situation in Greece, for example, was a bit more uh, like harsh. Like you couldn't even go out; you had to send an SMS. Yeah, we, had, we had more lockdowns. Yeah. This didn't this didn't happen in the US, right? This didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, in general, how do you deal with negative feedback? Oh, that, that's a very interesting thing and a very different culture between Europe and the US. When I joined Facebook, someone told me, a friend, feedback is a gift. And it is a gift. I also had negative feedback even if I got promoted at Facebook. For example, one of the things that I, I usually had to, to improve was sometimes you're super excited about something that you are getting on very, very deep topics and the audience cannot follow you. And then you have to actually adapt under this scenario because it can harm, right? I mean, even if you are the expert of things and because you are excited, of course, right? It's happening uh, uh, like accidentally. You have to feel like someone, the manager, now Evan is a co-founder of me, but back then he was a manager. He told me, Costas, we, we have to blindly trust you, but at the same time, improve this and, the, and this and that. It made me a better person. I, I don't believe that if you don't receive negative feedback, someone is lying to you, or you are like a person that doesn't hear. Uh, I receive negative feedback every single uh, month for something that I can improve. It's not negative necessarily. It's something that people here try to help you improve very, very small things, right? So in my opinion, negative feedback, any feedback is a gift. Negative, negative feedback can actually get you to a new layer, a new level. Cool. Um, we discussed a bit about, the, about your employees, etc., missed, etc. But now you are hiring a lot of people. Of course, you are not the HR, but what do you think, what to look for in the first 10 employees when you are building your own startup? You said... Uh, that, that's very interesting. Well, it depends if you are building a new blockchain or you are building a new platform that will use blockchain because this is different, right? 
building a new blockchain for us, we needed um, uh, one, two cryptographers, system engineers, database experts, and programming language experts. This was the thing that originally uh, formed the, the very first uh, like members of our team. If you're building products, because um, obviously I'm engaging with some of our partners, you definitely need someone, not necessarily a, a coder, but to understand the philosophy of what is an NFT, what is a good wallet. I mean, people, um, and I can see it, people who are not super technical, but have a, some, some, some uh, uh, like great ideas around products on top of blockchain, they can, they can actually build a team even from people who, who didn't do blockchain necessarily in the past. However, if you ask my opinion, you need one or two people in your team that they know and they have coded something about blockchain. Either this is um, smart contract development, but a real smart contract, right? Not just a very basic POC, uh, like proof of concept, a, a real one that it's used, or someone who was in a team and has seen some processes that usually fail just because you believe on some... Um, uh, some obstacles or some some things that eventually are not possible to be done in the blockchain and not everyone understands the limitations of the blockchain i think you need one or one or two people uh from this side ideally a systems expert in any any team uh would be super helpful this is usually someone who has to do with security or being able to understand how consensus work Great. Um, what is, uh, in your experience or opinion, I mean, what is the highest importance when you fundraise for the first time? In your case, it was team. You had, you had a Kigas team, Google, Facebook, Facebook, and other. So do you believe it's team, the MVP, if you have customers? What do you think? It, it depends. It, uh, yeah. This always depends on the sector. Second, on the stage of your startup. And the third one, even on uh, like the experience of the founders themselves, right? It, everything plays a role. So if you want to raise money with just an idea, it's generally more difficult. But you might be able to do if you uh, also be, if you are also in a state where you have to work personally, like as a founder to coding and all of this. I'm doing coding and reviewing every, every single day or week, right? Depending on on my calendar. I mean, I didn't stop. I'm, I'm reviewing uh, almost every day. Uh, there are some people who move, uh, who go and raise money after they have the first POC. This is also difficult, especially if it's a new market. But eventually, if you have clients and customers, and you can see some traction, and you want some grow, uh, yeah, there you have to, you have better chances to go and get money. Uh, but it all depends where you are, right? As I'm saying, it's different when you are in Europe, different where you are in the US. And obviously, it's good to have a network because sometimes even... I've seen people who cannot stand actually getting rejections and they stop. And at the same time, I've seen people who are like very passionate about what they're doing. They are very comfortable on even getting feedback and they improve. We also did mistakes while pitching. At the very beginning, probably the very first two weeks, we were trying to 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 arrange uh, like even the flow on how we're pitching differently, just to be able to express our ideas even to non-technicals. We shouldn't expect that everyone is technical on blockchains and, and this kind of stuff. So ideally, you also need to have some communication skills, right? It's it's not only um, uh, what uh, what you have designed. You also need to transfer this knowledge because the VCs will have half an hour to hear about your idea. And that's all you have. Yeah. And as you said, yeah, maybe you have 20 minutes or 30 minutes or one hour. How do you, do you have any tips on negotiation and closing a funding round that it's with good terms? I, I think, I think. Because there, is a, there is a huge negotiation. These meetings. Well, in our case, there was not huge negotiations. <laughs> I can <laughs> I can guarantee that. Uh, I Any think tips if, you, if you manage if you manage to convince someone to put money on you, the most uh, like difficult negotiations with us was to 
to pick who is going to lead it rather than who is going in because most of the investors wanted to be in. In the first round, by the way, even in the second round, some people were not allowed to go in because we were oversubscribed. Right? I had friends who wanted to invest and they couldn't. And then, I mean, imagine, right? You have to, you have to define where you, you put the limit, where you put the bar. But if you are not in this stage where like the VCs will follow you blindly just because you have a very, very strong credentials on, uh, from, from your previous experience or from your team, then usually after someone buys your idea, I think it depends on, on the case. If you manage to get someone be on boarded with you and they like to put some money, you will find your way. That's my personal opinion. So there is no good tricks what to do in negotiations. What can you do, right? Obviously, there, there are cases where someone might be a VC that they want to get everything out of you. This is not a good opportunity. And uh, at the same time, in some particular cases where you, you, you found the block on every, every other VC, but eventually you found someone who, with some question marks, they are putting money on you. Obviously, they have a, a higher risk. There is a reason why they want to go very aggressive on negotiations. In my opinion, you, you judge as well based on the feedback that you get from different VCs. And eventually, you might sacrifice a bit or you might even be more bullish just because you see uh, that, that your product is actually having some uh, extra value that you didn't expect. You're also learning, by the way. You're going to be seized that they have portfolio companies, and sometimes you don't know that you're also aligned to this particular market. And after the meeting, you get extra ideas. Oh, this is, this is super important, and we didn't think about it. We lost the opportunity. However, a good lesson. Cool. Um, um... In your okay, in your past, you have uh, run teams. You, you always run teams in your companies. How do you get your team aligned with all these the mission and your vision? And of course, you are a guy. Also, it gets excited, as you said. How you get your team maybe aligned? And that, that, that's uh, that's that's a great question, by the way. And I can tell you for sure because we were thinking about this exactly for the Greek team. I mean, we we created the solution engineering team in Greece. And we try to see, okay, I will be remote. I will work from the U.S. And most of the team is in the U.S. or it's outside uh, Europe. How do you create a new, a new company? And what is the uh, like secret sauce that you need to make them engaged? We found two or three key people who are excited and they're hard workers. I feel it's a contagion eventually. If you see someone who is passionate about something... And they can even unblock you. They can guide you. They can even give you opportunities for training. This usually affects everything uh, regarding the perception of your new employees. And this is what we did. And at the same time, if you ask me, um, I'm focusing a lot on the career path of people. I'm even in every, every single meeting or even on like once per month or something, we're, discuss we're discussing in particular with everyone what do you want to achieve? I can help you. This gives uh, crazy incentives. And I can tell you for sure that people are getting a lot better. They are getting also excited. And you also give them some responsibilities and ownership, right? Giving ownership to people is also good. So I've seen many people who are uh, many leaders who don't delegate stuff because they believe they are experts and nobody else can do what, the, what they are doing. But this is wrong. If you don't give the opportunity to other people to grow, then you are doomed to do all of the work by yourself. Why do you need the team? Um, so in my opinion, when I've learned this, how to delegate, it wasn't easy for me. I was also stubborn uh, back in the past that I said, okay, uh, nobody can solve this, but obviously I was wrong. And then gradually you are learning, right? Uh, because sometimes you need fresh ideas and actually people who can see outside the box that you are at this moment. And this helps a lot. So you have to inspire them and you have to give them to show them a way that they can also grow. That's the two tricks uh, that is a win-win situation. The, everyone wins in this particular case. Yeah. Uh, I imagine in the beginning when you started, you had an idea. I mean, that idea from the current product that you plan to launch or launch, how different it is? 
the core idea of the the core idea of building a next generation blockchain is still there. We optimized a few things uh, down the process, like um, focusing on developer experience even more. Um, uh, like the, there are a few partnerships that you see down the road, and obviously you have to make your uh, uh, like your mindset into let's focus on building one SWE, one blockchain that is great rather than thinking of 10 ideas. And then gradually you leave out a few of uh, your original ideas, but you are left with something that was in the original pitch. So if, if you ask me, in the original pitch, we had three or four verticals, and now we're focusing on the best of them. But we didn't, we didn't um, actually uh, completely pivot or do anything else than what we promised to do. It's still the same thing. It's just focusing a bit more on things that we believe we need improvements. Cool. I have another two, two questions. Okay, we went a bit uh, long, but I, I always love discussing with you. And, and hopefully this podcast will help a lot of people, I believe. So what goes first? You're an engineer, of course, but what's, what goes first, engineering or business or sales? For, for myself in person personally you mean um for you yeah in your opinion what goes um, for or business okay so after you get the co-founder obviously you have to get more involved into the business side of things i cannot remove the hat of research if you ask me i'm still i'm still super uh, interested on in proposing new ideas however i found a way how to link this to business pitching, providing new ideas for clients. So I slightly changed my mindset to being just a general coder or proposing something that would be applicable in the industry for the next in the next 20 years for something that's applicable now. So I combined my research interest, uh, transforming it to be appealing to business. This is how I, uh, this is what I personally do. And many times you also need coding because you need to verify your claims. So for a co-founder, obviously you have to have a business perspective as well, but not always, right? I mean, now I'm one year after the, the very beginning where you had to be uh, really focused on delivering and implementing stuff. Eventually, you know how to delegate, you know who to trust, and now you can spend time on business as well. And however, I'm telling you, between co-founders, there are different levels. For example, Evan and Adenigi are more on the business side, while myself, George, and Sam are mostly on the technical side. What I'm saying is we all adapt to meet the requirements of the business. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, my last question is not about uh, tech, uh, it's not about, uh, about business, etc. So before I do my last question, do you have uh, any things to add to the whole conversation in terms of work? I think we covered most of the part. What I will ask from the community, if any of you is interested in learning something, independently on if you are joining a blockchain company or uh, like you just need some mentorship, feel free to reach out, right? I can help. I also have a network of people who can help. It's not only me. And usually it takes like 30 minutes for someone to get inspired. And I'm happy to do this uh, whenever required. I don't have unlimited time, unfortunately, but maybe we can arrange it down the road and in the next few months, whenever I find some gap in my schedule, I can, I can, I can provide some help, but I can also receive feedback, right? I'm happy to receive feedback offline. Hey, for Cyprus, at least we're going to have a mini accelerator down the line. Uh, we'll need mentors. So we'll reach out also. And um, okay, if you are building a tech company, what you will what would you be doing? Okay, S something that I learned from the past is I would try to find, uh, in my opinion, unless I'm in a stage where I'm still a student that I can survive and all of this, I would try to find some funding. Because one of the issues that we had in our first startup, as I, I told you, like when I was still in Greece, was that we put money from our pocket and then we felt the pressure in our pocket and then we couldn't grow. 
So definitely prepare something. I mean, if, before you get funding and you need some seed, of course, you have to do some work, but eventually you need to ask for funding. Otherwise, you will feel the pressure for yourself if you cannot survive. If you are from a family or you have some uh, deposits in, uh, uh, in the no, bank... No, no, no. Um, Costas, the question was, if you weren't building a tech company, what would you... What ah, if you I'm want? not building a tech company. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I can tell you what I'm doing on my investments. Uh, some of my investments go to AI and environment. I would probably be um, in the future. I would probably be an in, I mean, if, if I manage to succeed on what I'm doing, because, I mean, you cannot do everything now. If I stop today, I still have to work. Uh, but if I had the opportunity to be in the investor side, I would try to, to be a partner on a VC or something to help uh, first myself actually being uh, in, in, in the context of learning of new ideas and secondly, investing on new ideas. This is what I would do. Completely outside tech, completely outside tech. I told you I'm, uh, uh, I'm very obsessed about like how, how environment and like all of these environmental changes are changing uh, like humanity and the future. If you have kids, it's always in the back of your mind, right? So yeah. I don't know, I would, I, I could be a Darwin or a Zakiv Cousteau or something. Uh, but yeah, this is something that excites me if you ask me outside tech. Yeah, when we stop our tech, we, would, we will probably open a, a venture capital fund and we'll invest in these ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm gradually trying, by the way, right? I mean, we have, obviously, I'm doing SWE, but obviously, when you are in the US, you have to invest as well. I'm gradually trying to find new investments, even for diversifying my portfolio, uh, probably AI. Yeah, people are asking, uh, was the last question in about, uh, do you have a back bounty program for SWE? Wallet? There will soon be back bounties for SWE. I, if I remember correctly, there is nothing else running at the moment, uh, but there is a plan to have a back bounty, yes. Not only for the wallet, but also for, for the blockchain. You said you have a Discord channel. I imagine if somebody joins the Discord channel, they will get updates on all yeah, of Yeah, we, we have Telegram, we have Discord, and then you can go and ask there any, any of these questions, of course. Cool. Uh, many thanks for your time. I know that you are very busy. Um, many thanks for doing the first uh, episode of Live with Panis podcast. Um, our next episode will be tomorrow at 8 o'clock Cyprus time, 7, as we said, Europe, so Trinistep Europe time. We'll have Alexander Lieder. Alexander uh, is the founder of Skillful.ai, an AI company that does uh, around the, in the human resource and HR industry. Uh, so, uh, see you. Have a nice night. Thank you for joining us. And see you tomorrow. If you are, want to join us for tomorrow. And as we said, Monday to Friday, Europe time, 7 Central Eastern Europe time. Uh, uh, we'll have a, a show for you to ask questions to entrepreneurs of all ages around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pani, and good luck.